assure you guys, I'm not actually going to talk about <coughs> general relativity at all. There's no equations or anything. Just, just the one slide. Um, really, where, where this comes from is, is uh, what we see on the news every day. The, the, the troubles that face society, um, you know, uh, the climate, environment, uh, energy, security, and all those things. Even though I approach these things as a physicist, but I care about them more as a father. And that's where the energy for this, this talk comes from. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in the course of uh, researching uh, physics and teaching physics, I noticed a pattern uh, looking back through history. And uh, the pattern is this. It has four parts. First is that we've been in similar trouble before to what we face now several times in the past. The second thing is, um, each time society has been transformed through the, the course of these crises, it has, uh, the transformations have been accompanied by, or maybe enabled by, uh, revolutions in fundamental physics. That's the second thing I noticed. And the third thing I noticed is that the revolutions in physics always came from unification, episodes of unification where Two things that were disparate, or believed to be disparate, were shown to be actually the same thing. And the fourth thing I noticed is that whenever that happened, the people who were responsible for unifying the two things um, didn't know that what was going to happen. It, it could never have been predicted or brought about by governments, funding agencies, or for-profit corporations, or anything like that. It happened out of pure human curiosity. Often, not only independent of what, it, what most people were doing, but actually uh, in opposition, really, to what what, the, uh, what people were mostly doing in science at the time. Off in the corner, somebody dreaming discovers something that then goes on to change the world. So what I thought was I'd quickly go through five examples of this. I think there may be a lesson for in, uh, in the problems that we face today. So yeah, this is the talk here. To start with, I'm going to go backwards in time, so starting from most recent. Think about the World Wide Web. You know, it's immense potential that we see for, for helping us overcome trouble, you know, connecting people, bringing people together, uh, democratizing people, giving voices to people without voices. You might think that this must have grown out of you know, the, the trouble we face. Perhaps a government saw the problem and said, you know, put out a call for somebody to invent something like the World Wide Web <clears throat> to help us. It's exactly the opposite. The World Wide Web, it turns out, was invented by a bunch of high energy physicists at CERN in 1990. And their only concern was, how can we possibly share these massive reams of data that we're collecting? You know, in order to do that, they found they had to invent this thing called the World Wide Web. And that's what, that, that's what led to you know, Facebook and, and Kickstarter and, and uh, Uber and all these things that, that now you know, we take for granted. Um, they were working on something called the standard model. Standard model is basically a, a name for uh, an all-encompassing theory of physics that it, it pretty much describes everything in physics today, except for gravity. So electricity, magnetism, the forces that hold atoms together, and the forces that make the sun shine. All of that stuff is part of the standard model. And that's the same standard model that actually produced computers. You know, things like transistors and lasers that were developed in the 40s and 50s came out of the same research. So this is where um, what we call the information age uh, came from. And, and if you ask, uh, where did that standard model come from? You find out that it, it came from the union of two totally different things. One, quantum mechanics, which is the physics of very small things. The other, special relativity, that's the physics of very fast things. And those two things were brought together by people like Higgs and Dirac. Uh, that's where the standard model came from. But if you go back and see when they did that, the World Wide Web would have been the last thing. They would have never dreamed that they were what they were doing was going to lead to a World Wide Web, let alone in computers or anything like that. What they were doing was just arranging patterns in what, in what seemed to them the most beautiful way. One of the things that they came up with was what's called the Eightfold Path. Things like that. So the lesson to me is, yeah, 
it's important for us to try to solve problems, you know, in practical ways. But I think maybe it's just as important to let people dream and play in quiet corners. So the next example, nuclear energy. You know, that's a fairly clean, stable, safe source of energy. You might think you know, that would have been created by people with a, with a view to the future to help the humanity. But actually, it came from atomic weapons, which in turn came from, um, from special relativity here, which uh, can be described by a formula that everybody knows, E equals mc squared. And mass turns into a lot of energy. That is what led to uh, not just atomic weapons, but, but, but nuclear power as well. And that's what led us to the atomic age in the post-war <clears throat> time. But if you ask, uh, where did special relativity come from? You find that it was Albert Einstein who did that, and he did it by unifying two things. One was classical physics, that's the physics of objects. And the other was electromagnetism, that's the physics of light. You see, ordinary things like balls, if you throw a ball from a moving train, the ball goes faster. If you shine a flashlight from a moving train, the light in the flashlight's beam travels at the same speed, regardless of what the train is doing. It's amazing how light defies the laws of everything else. It makes no sense. And it didn't make any sense until Einstein asked himself as a, as a child, what would it be like to ride on a light beam? To travel with a light beam, how would the world look? It was that question that led to special relativity, which in turn led to the whole atomic age. To go back a little further, you might ask, well, where did uh, electromagnetism come from? For that matter, where did lights come from? Where did radio come from? Telecommunications. Where did the power grid come from that we all depend on for everything? All that stuff came from electromagnetism, which is the union of electricity and magnetism. Formerly, these were thought to be totally different things. And the people in the 1850s, 1860s started to suspect that they might be the same. And that's what led to the whole modern age, the electrical age. The funny thing is, if you go back to when they did that, people like Faraday and Maxwell, you find the world was very dark back then. There were, things were lit by gas lamps, oil lamps. And Faraday used to go around doing shows about electricity. People would go into a dark hall, and he would show the sparks, and people would clap and say, wow, it's like a magic show. That's what electricity started as. And uh, there was a famous episode where the, 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 the chancellor of the exchequer, that's like the, the banker in chief, you know, came up to Faraday after this one of these shows, and he said, I love the show, electricity is pretty cool, but what could it ever possibly be good for? Faraday gave one of the greatest answers in the history of science when he said, I, I actually don't know what this is going to be good for, sir. He said, but I guess that someday you may find a way to tax it. <laughs> That's where you know, now when we pay our hydro bills, think about that. It all came from, from somebody playing in a laboratory and, and discovering that when you, when you wave a magnet near, near a wire, electricity appears. A little bit further, how about steam power, steamships, locomotives? You might think uh, somebody must have seen that child labor was being exploited to, to, to dig coal out of the ground. And there must be a better way, and perhaps they put out a call for steam power to be invented. Actually, when you dig back, you find people were exploring primitive concepts like the what is heat? It used to be people thought heat was a kind of fluid that moved around. But way back in the early 1800s, people discovered that heat is actually just motion, a very small thing that happens. So it's, it's the same physics as everything else. And they put Newton's physics of everything else together with the idea that heat is just moving stuff and produce the whole practical thing. That's what led to the Industrial Revolution, or at the very least, came along at the same time as the Industrial Revolution. So go back a little further to actually, I think, the most dramatic example of all. Science itself. You guys, I think, have all heard the story of how Newton was 
I was sitting under an apple tree and apple fell on him, and he, and he realized, hey, the force that makes the apple fall is the same force that holds the moon around the earth. And this is a famous story, it may or may not have happened. So we all, we all know that you know, the result of it was the physics that we all have to learn in school, you know, but it, it was much more than that. Go back to the time before Newton. The way people saw the world in it was very different. There were, the universe was divided into two parts. Above the moon, everything was perfect. Things didn't change. They were eternal, and they moved in circles. And they obeyed very special laws. Below the moon, it was just the opposite. <clears throat> Things were corrupt. They were changeable. Life was terrible and short and messy. And people just lived with that. There was the celestial world, and there was what was called the sublunar world. In the sublunar world, things moved in straight lines. If you drop something, it would fall straight. But in the sky, things moved in circles. It was obvious. Newton put, got rid of all that at one stroke when he realized that the laws that govern the moon are the same as the laws that govern the map. What that did was brought perfection to Earth, gave people hope for the first time. We don't actually have to accept this corrupt and changeable world. We can understand it, maybe even control it. Imagine how that changes society. That's, that's where uh, science and the enlightenment came from. So these are five examples of unification in physics and what came from it. Now I go back to uh, the standard model at the very top of this. I mentioned how that describes everything except gravity. Newton did one more thing. He invented uh, a theory of gravity. And, but that was shown to be inadequate by Einstein. It would replace it with something called general relativity. General relativity is the idea that gravity is a very special force. It's like unlike all the others. The other forces, they live in space and time. They, they, they propagate through space and time. Gravity is space and time. Wherever space and time are warped or curved, we feel gravity. So it's very hard to reconcile those two theories together. Nobody's been able to do it. This is the last great challenge in physics. How do you unify these two things? They're as opposite as opposite to me. Nobody's been able to do it. What if we could, though, unify those? About, uh, if you would ask me, what can we expect from that? I can't say. And anybody who, who, who tells you they can say what would come from that is probably mistaken. Just the same way that all those other people couldn't have predicted anything. We couldn't say. But you could maybe imagine if we could control gravity you know, or manipulate gravity. What could, what could come out of that? You could only just dream of a possible consequence. The movie Interstellar explored some of that. So uh, I think, uh, you know, I wouldn't ask a physicist, I'd probably ask a science fiction writer or a novelist or something what might come out of that. But that's, I think, is the, is the, the next big episode of unification. And what all we can say is that's where the future is.